delighted to be the one to introduce our speaker today, Joan Johnson Lewis, who is the leader of the Riverdale Yonkers Society since uh, 2015, when she took charge of a dwindling society, an aging society, and injected new life into it and really, really brought it around. Uh, it was one of our mainstays for so many years, and Joan is doing a tremendous job in restoring it. But Joan's been an ethical leader for over 30 years. She was also a leader in the Chicago Ethical Humanist Society, the Northern Virginia, Virginia Society, and uh, part-time at the Brooklyn Society. And she's also been very active with the American Ethical Union. She was, that's our federation of, uh, a national federation of societies, and served as its interim uh, executive director for a time. And she was on the board for several stints. Joan is a number of things. Uh, in addition to being an ethical culture leader, she's a transformation coach, an instructor of compassionate communication or nonviolent communication, and is um, an editor for about.com on women's history. So she has also uh, gone spelunking through the ethical culture archives looking for our own women of ethical culture and their stories. And she has a wonderful platform in describing the women of ethical culture. And then again, she's really a leader among the leaders. Uh, she has been president of the uh, National Leaders Council, but she's always been a guide and a support and um, an educator to the other leaders. And I really look up to her as do many, as do all the others. Uh, Joan has a BA from Mundelein College, now part of Loyola University, and a, a Master of Divinity from Meadville Lombard Seminary. So she has education from all sides. And today she's going to talk to us about that music and the persistence of the mythology. Joan, welcome to the platform. Thank you, Richard. And I just would start by um, saying that, especially at Riverdale Yonkers, um, I haven't done that alone. Had lots of partners. Liz Collier works with me, and our lay members and a very active board have been um, a key part of some of that revitalization. Um, this week, with John Lewis in the news with his memorial service, I want to start with some words from him. If you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. Well, I would add to that, that I, and I think he'd want us to add, that we also have a moral obligation to open our eyes and see more than we're seeing. It's hard to see what we don't question. Well, I'm so glad to be here today to virtually talk. Um, I've spoken for the New York Society um, almost every year for the last few years. And this time I get to bring the folks I currently serve with me. I also welcome the guests from many other societies. I'm honored especially to speak about a topic which might seem like history, but I think it really is about current events. Movements and government bodies face the challenge today of what to do with monuments to Confederate heroes. We all face the challenge of unpacking the myths behind the monuments. We all face the challenge of noticing how much we've taken that myth in, consciously or not, and how much that affects people and issues today. My apologies in advance to those who already know most of this, as I know some of you may. My experience, though, is that even among progressives, many do not know this. What I learned in school and what I know now are very different. I've been unlearning a lot through my life of what I learned in school, and I'm still learning and unlearning. So I'll start by saying that that term lost cause in this meaning of it was first used in a Southern history textbook written right after the Civil War. Uh, but the idea of the lost cause developed more as an ideology in a number of writings in the 1870s. And then groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, took up with great energy promoting the idea of the lost cause. It was promoted heavily again in the early 1900s, the 1950s and 60s, and is again returning in explicit form. I'm more worried though about how it gets promoted implicitly and among those who don't see themselves as racists or Confederate defenders. I do wanna be clear about my own approach to history. Um, although I no longer write about women's history, 
Um, I spent almost 20 years writing part-time, trying to make history approachable and understandable to the general public. Behind my writing were two assumptions. One is that we all see history through the lens not only of the present, but of our own biases. There's no such thing as completely objective history. But that doesn't mean that we can't get better history or have worse history. So second, we need to question our biases. That means looking at evidence, not only that might confirm the interpretation, but also evidence that might be in contradiction. Evidence often can show which interpretations are closer to or farther away from the evidence. And I think that's very true with the interpretation of the Civil War called the Lost Cause. There are six major assertions in this interpretation, all of which I think fail when evidence is examined. Um, and that's why I call it a myth or even more an ideology. So first I'll briefly go over the version of the Civil War that the Lost Cause asserts. The first part is that the cause of the war was secession and the refusal of the North to accept secession. Related to that is that secession in this ideology was primarily about states' rights and economic rights, primarily tariffs. Second, that the Confederate soldiers were heroic and saintly, defending a noble way of life. Third, and related to that, is that the Confederate generals generally were heroic and saintly, and the most heroic and saintly of all Confederates, maybe of all Americans, was Robert E. Lee, also defending a noble way of life. Now, a corollary to this about the nobility of the soldiers and the generals is the idea that Union soldiers were all brutal and uneducated, and their generals uneducated and crude. The fourth principle is that the Confederacy was defeated only because the Union had many more soldiers and a lot more money. Or sometimes it's because there was a betrayal by certain Southerners of the cause. The fifth piece is that Southern women were loyal supporters of the Confederate cause, that their many losses of loved ones sanctified woman, Southern womanhood and related to that, the defeat was itself a violation of Southern womanhood. Uh, the sixth assertion is a whole body of assertions about the system called slavery. Now, the core assertion of the Lost Cause is that slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War, uh, but at the same time, the Lost Cause insists um, certain things about the nature of that institution. The Lost Cause insists that slavery was a benign institution benefiting those who were enslaved much more than it hurt them. The stories of mistreatment of those who were enslaved are exaggerated or, or are rarely true. And that in general, those enslaved were faithful slaves. That's the, the phrase often used. Loyal to their masters and the Confederate cause. And finally, part of this is that those people who were enslaved were unable to take care of themselves or provide for themselves or exercise self-rule. And that latter assumption both justified enslavement in the first place and explained why those who supported this ideology opposed any rule, role for the formerly enslaved in a post-war South. Now, sometimes a seventh one is added, which is that enslavement was going to end anyway because it was no longer economically viable. So all of these assertions pretty much fail when tested by evidence. First, every single official declaration by a state of secession makes clear that the ability of the state to continue enslaving people of African descent was the core reason for secession. Secession was about preserving what was called the peculiar institution. And I use that phrase even though it's often misunderstood. It doesn't mean strange. In the way peculiar was used at the time, it meant distinctive or characteristic. In other words, without enslavement, the South, maybe the whole United States of America, would not be what it was. If you doubt that this was the cause of secession, that slavery was, I challenge you to read those articles of secession, which are easily available in the days of the internet. Um, try to find two or three that don't center the assertion of a right to enslave 
and the need to preserve that distinctive American way. You will not find them. And yes, enslavement in America was distinctive and was characteristic. So many of us are sitting here in New York State. Um, New York didn't end enslavement until 1827, although under some conditions that meant that there were still a few enslaved people in New York in 1860. Uh, corollary to this is that in 1821, New York extended the vote in what was called universal suffrage. But of course, no women were included in that universal, only white men. The new laws actually in 1821 disenfranchised free black men in New York who had been able to vote before if they had enough property to qualify under the old rules. So I recommend that you read the articles of secession and speeches supporting secession at the time of secession. It's unavoidable to see that those who promoted secession defended it at the time primarily as grounded in preserving enslavement. So secession and states' rights is the cause of war. You know, a few years before the war started, there was passed the Fugitive Slave Law. And many states in the North protested that that law overrode their states' rights to end enslavement within their territory. The abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, even at the time, publicly burned a copy of the Constitution and called for the secession of Massachusetts and any other states that had ended enslavement. The federal government, which was then controlled by states that practiced enslavement, asserted the federal right over state decisions on this matter. Many senators and congressmen who later left when their states seceded responded to those early threats of secession by denying that there was any such right. Oh, and in case all that doesn't convince thoroughly, I wanna add one more item. The Confederacy included in its new constitution a provision. There was one state's rights, one state's right that did not exist in that constitution explicitly. No state had the right to end enslavement. No state in the Confederacy was permitted that state's right. So the first assertion of the lost cause of protecting a right to secede and protecting states' rights was as the reason for the war and not enslavement is just clearly false. The second assertion that Confederate soldiers were saintly and defenders of a noble way of life, well, we see that that noble way of life was itself an arrangement of life where a very few white people were free to live a life of relative comfort and ease built on the forced labor of others. The idea that the soldiers were voluntarily defending their own way of life may partially be grounded in trying to contrast the South and the North. You know, at the time there were draft riots in the North, including in New York City, protesting um, serving in the army. But what most people have not been taught is that the first general military draft in America, long before those draft riots, was a draft by the Confederate government, more than a year before the Union had a draft. The Confederate draft included an exemption for anyone who owned 20 or more slaves. Most of the soldiers were not defending their way of life, but the way of life of those most wealthy in society. And those who were wealthy were very often able to avoid military service. Plus, there were many incidents well documented of brutality on the part of the Confederate soldiers and Confederate Army. It was routine that instead of capturing Black Union soldiers, those soldiers were killed. No army is going to be completely free of brutality and what we might consider today war crimes. The Confederates were not immune. And the Union soldiers and generals were not as stupid and brutal as the Lost Cause portrays them. And that Robert E. Lee, who resigned his commission in the US Army to fight against the country he'd sworn to protect. Again, there's plenty of evidence he wasn't all that noble. He mistreated those who his family enslaved. He was not himself in favor after the war of elevating to any kind of sa sainthood anyone from the war, much less himself. 
And yet most biographies of Robert E. Lee until the 20th century, the late 20th century, are actually more like hagiographies, that is a worshipful recounting of a virtual sainthood. In 1935, one historian wrote of him, his character offers historians no moral flaws to probe. Well, that's not a human being. <laughs> more recent analysis accepts that Lee's flawed military strategy both helped prolong the war and was a key reason for the defeat of the Confederacy. Which leads us to the next assertion that the war was lost by the South only because of superior numbers and resources in the North. There's a little truth to that. There were superior numbers and resources, but the lost cause ide ideology ignores the failures of Confederate military strategy and ignores some of the brilliance of strategies of the Union because that would challenge the whole fabric of the lost cause myth. Now, personally, I'm not fond of reading military history, but I have read enough to be convinced that the Civil War was not just won by numbers. The betrayal of some of the Southerners as um, part of the cause, well, you know, after the Civil War, there were charges that some generals had not been fully into it. But it just happens that those were the generals who after the war began to defend the rights of the newly freed people. And so they became part of the enemy. Certainly one factor that is often discounted because it is contrary to the lost cause myth is the extreme dissatisfaction of so many people in the South with the war itself. And especially with how long it went on. In several cities, near starving women organized protests in the South, which also discounts that myth of universal support of the war. Uh, ah, I just lost my script, hold on. Um, yeah, so the idea, you know, the fact that there were war protests by Southern women um, discounts that myth that the Southern women white women universally supported the war. Most Southern white women, like most Southern white men, were poor. It is true that a majority of Southern families did enslave at least one person, but only a few families could afford a plantation enslaving hundreds. Southern women on those plantations were before and after the war idealized. But that idealization didn't include the women who were enslaved who were often raped, forced to separate from their children. It doesn't include the stories of poor white women. And even those wives and daughters of the Southern wealthy were living in a patriarchal system largely under the control of their husbands and fathers. More recent research also shows that many of those women in turn exercised brutality against the enslaved. The myth of the pure Southern woman is, like all myths of women on pedestals, more convenient than historical. It only ever referred to white women of the upper classes. It assumed they had a passive, not active role in running uh, the enslavement operations. And it assumed that they were able to live lives of freedom and luxury. And finally, we come to the myths about how benign slavery was. Here, I highly recommend that people in ethical culture read some of the writings of our own Moncure Conway. Conway was born in Virginia to a family that asserted that it owned people. He became a Methodist minister and then an abolitionist and then a Unitarian minister. He was run out of a Unitarian church in Washington, DC because he opposed slavery. And then he became more of an independent free thinker. During the Civil War, he was invited to become the minister of a free church in England. He was in England because he went there during the war to help the con convince the British to stay out of the war. It had been a great risk that because of the dependency of the British textile industry on cotton, that the Brits would enter on the side of the South. Well, Conway later returned to life in America for a few years, and the congregation he had led in England after he left became an ethical society. Conway returned there to lead that side society for a number of more years, so we can claim him late in life as an ethical leader. 
Conway's writings document from someone who was there and witnessed it firsthand, many of the brutalities and injustices of enslavement. His mother, who on one hand fit a bit the stereotype of the mistress who went into the cabins of the enslaved with food and medicine, because of her close connections, so came to hate enslavement that she separated from her husband during the Civil War, living instead in Ohio. Conway himself took the people that his father claimed to own and brought them north to Ohio well before the Emancipation Proclamation. And was enslavement about to end anyway? Well, Conway's own family story can help us understand that. I said his family enslaved people, but they didn't have a plantation. Conway's father ran a factory. The workers were not paid because they were enslaved. Cotton was still a valuable resource as well, both domestically and international trade. That industry was not really fading much. So by the time of the Civil War, the institution of enslavement was adapting and would likely have continued to adapt to industrialization. And yes, many poor white men who were forced to serve as Confederate soldiers did understand, we know that from their letters, that in some ways they were secondary victims of enslavement because it kept their wages low in agriculture and in the beginnings of this more industrial economy. That's why so many of the Southern men either went to the North and fought for the Union or resisted fighting. And some may not have fought as well or as nobly as the myth would have had us think. Enslavement was by no means benign. It included rape, mistreatment, torture, even killing. And after the war, the lost cause ideology now points to the inferior freedmen unable to live in freedom without protection of the former enslavers. It is true that many who had been enslaved were not well educated. To educate at all was against the laws of Southern states and often severely punished. But there was an initial rush to education. There was a union experiment in the Sea Islands off of Georgia, where the union freed formerly enslaved people during the war and that experiment showed that bringing in education was welcome and helpful towards self-rule and that dividing the property that the former landowners had abandoned and having that be a, an economic base for those enslaved left a more secure foundation for the future. Unfortunately, that was not done for the bulk of people who were liberated later. Well, I would urge you to read one or more of the new, many newer books that show the incredible burst of liberation that there actually was after the war. Thousands from the North, black and white, came down to be educators to help the formerly enslaved catch up. Many of those who were now free exercised political power competently, wisely, and well. After the Constitution was amended to give black men the vote and full citizenship. A black man became a senator. Several black men were elected to Congress. Thousands of black men held local political offices. And then came the backlash. The lost cause ideology was itself invented to defend and power the backlash, to provide justification for putting the formerly enslaved back into positions not that different in their economic and power relationships like sharecropping. Part of the continuing backlash was the construction, often of cheap materials, of hundreds of monuments over decades to white supremacy and to the Confederacy. And yes, many of those monuments in the news explicitly have the words white supremacy on the base of the statue. You won't see that mentioned by those defending the statues and rarely mentioned in the press. The last thing the defenders want is to reveal that white supremacy is indeed the single most important underlying ideology of the lost cause. Just as it was the underlying ideology supporting the enslavement of people of African descent and pushing Native Americans from their lands, often with genocide, to provide, quote, free and empty land for settlers. Well, I talked with some respect for the work of Moncure Conway in helping bring to light 
evidence that is contrary to the myth of the lost cause. Now I'm gonna say a bit about another person associated with ethical culture and what he had to say about these myths. David Seville Muzzy, demonized even today by conservatives for his role in shaping millions of minds in America through his textbooks on American history, popular for decades in the 20th century. David Muzzy served for a time as a senior leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture, and he served as a leader of the Westchester Society. He was a graduate of Union Theological Seminary and a professor at Columbia. But why is his work demonized by many conservatives? They use it as an example of why public education is evil. And the reason is because Muzzy generally tells a story of the progressive liberation of America, the progressive increase in human rights and democracy, the advancement of human flourishing, beginning with the enlightenment and the toppling of kings. He values the power of a federal government. There are still many today who do not agree with those ideas of human rights and democracy, and I'm gonna come back to them. But first, Muzzy. And here we get to another school of historical interpretation, one that was influenced by and influenced those who believed in the lost cause, the Dunning School, with its view of what happened in the historical period called Reconstruction. I went to public school in the 50s and 60s in the North. The Dunning School was still the prevailing view taught in public schools. Yet critics have existed, most notably W.B. Du Bois, whose work on Reconstruction period countered the Dunning School in the early 20th century. So the Dunning School version is that Reconstruction was a huge mistake. That the reason we are divided today as a nation is because the North imposed its rule on the South. The South was not allowed in this view to solve its own problem as it was best suited to do. I'm here characterizing the Dunning School, not my own thinking. It taught that the white Southerners who formerly had enslaved people knew those people best, and they were the best ones to help them adjust to freedom. As one historian characterized Reconstruction, the North tried to make Negroes intelligent by legislative act, and by implication, that was impossible. So those writing about people of the South really meant white people of the South, and especially those who had been and began again to be the more powerful. I admit here that I lost a friend a few years ago. Um, she was raised in the South, very anti-racist, um, worked in civil rights, um, saw herself as anti-racist, but she continued to post on my social media threads about how the Confederate flag does not represent slavery, it represents Southern heritage. And she could not understand when I regularly challenged her that she only meant white Southern heritage, even though in all the states of the South, non-white people have been a substantial population during enslavement and after. That disappearing of a whole part of the population was something that is insulting to my many other friends who are black and whose families are themselves from the South. But back to the Dunning School. If you were taught a version of American history where the black people were all unprepared to rule and they did it ineffectively in that brief period after the Civil War, if you were taught that scalawags and carpetbaggers were the main cause of problems in that period, if you were taught that the South had to rise up and end that so-called tragedy and reassert power, Maybe you were even taught that the Klan was mainly to scare superstitious black people and that they didn't really do any actual harm. Then you were taught by textbooks that were influenced by the Dunning School. Almost all such textbooks include the phrase ignorant Negroes to describe the newly freed people who were trying to figure out how to exercise their newly won rights of citizenship, voting, and public office. And nearly all include a depiction of enslavement as mostly benign. And I'm sorry to say that included David Muzzy's textbooks. The idea that there was a brief flowering of human liberation after the Civil War that was then brutally suppressed didn't fit in with his story of a slow and progressive expansion of human rights. He does say in his books that defense of slavery was one cause of the Civil War, but he equally or greater um, credits abolitionism with provoking the war with his assessment that the main cause was the North's hostility to slavery. 
His books depict the efforts of Reconstruction as damaging to the South, meaning, of course, to the white people of the South. He cites, and this is a direct quote from him, the unbearable burden of Negro rule. One of the most damaging effects of Reconstruction, he asserts, is that ignorant former slaves were set against, and again I quote, the only people who could really help them, their old masters. He wrote of scalawags, carpetbaggers, and their Negro tools. Muzzy taught a few generations of students about what he called the crime of Reconstruction and how that attempt to empower the formerly enslaved is the root cause, he said, of today's sectional bitterness. Other Dunning School historians were even more explicit. Some taught that the rise of the KKK and other militias was necessary and why to restore whites to their rightful dominant position of power. They, after all, knew best what the South needed. I'll add that Muzzy is also cringeworthy in his language and ideas about Native Americans. He manages to combine two different stereotypes when he writes that the natives of North America had some noble qualities, but at bottom they were a treacherous, cruel people. Another excerpt from one of his books, from the death of Christopher Columbus in 1506 to the planting of the first permanent English colony on the shores of America in 1607, just a century elapsed, a century filled with romantic voyages and thrilling tales of explo exploration and conquest in the new world. Well, that's a little more benign sounding, but notice it, that it's all from the perspective of, the, of those conquering those being conquered or massacred, uh, I don't think would have called it romantic and thrilling. A major question we should always be asking about historical assertions is whose perspective are we talking about? In that essay, Muzzy also talks about, in the next sentence, about how centuries later, the Europeans would have a scientific study of the native races. Well, I think we now recognize how much of that scientific study was based on the, on the assumption, first of all, that there is such a thing as biological race, and then was often undertaken in order to prove why it was that Caucasians should be on the top of the hierarchy. Today, we see recurring attempts to explain racial disparities in outcomes in life by, quote, scientific reasoning about race and ability, even within the free thought community. So the root idea of the lost cause and its cousin, the Dunning School, really is white supremacy. And even within that, the right of upper class white men to rule and a trust that they do so more nobly and justly than any democratic organization of power could possibly do. You know, it's very hard when one of our own, in addition to much good work that he's done, turns out to also have been key to teaching principles of white supremacy. Because yes, that view of reconstruction, as well as the view of the lost cause, they are about white supremacy. And within that, the supremacy of a few in the upper class. The enslaved or formerly enslaved are assumed to be inferior, not deserving of an equal voice. And even poor whites and women are supporting characters often mentioned only in ways that assume that they unquestionably support the power of the wealthy white men. Well, I hope those of you here have either read already or will read Ibram X. Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning. Um, I love how he documents how many of our adored figures, even in liberal and progressive circles, acted out of racism and white supremacy, that people could be both racist and anti-racist. Kendi documents in his book many people who were anti-racist and pro-democracy at times and then would reinforce white supremacy and elitism at other times. We in our movement have some reconciliation to do. We have long honored Muzzy's positive work without acknowledging his major negative impacts on society. It's part of the difficult and nuanced conversations that we need to have at all levels of American society today, if we're to take seriously the ideas that Black Lives Matter. Well, I'm not gonna end there. 
with the history because the ideas of the Dunning School and the Lost Cause pervade our culture today. And they did not begin after the Civil War. I noticed in chat at the beginning how many people were expressing things that are actually part of that Lost Cause ideology. Enslavement was idealized while it was going on and not just after the war. Those ideologies did not start with the Civil War. A few um, European and American writers um, wrote of the other side, but largely the idea of an idyllic South is a vivid image. The, popular, the popularity of the movie Gone with the Wind, which itself was an explicit part of the Lost Cause ideology, shows us how powerfully that image is in our, has remained in our culture. When Gone with the Wind was briefly exiled this year from an online movie service, there were cries of protest. And I have to wonder, would we similarly protest exiling a movie idealizing and romanticizing German Nazi rule? Would such a movie even be as widely popular? Well, just a week ago, I read an article by a current conservative thinker. His message in that was, we need to understand that the Declaration of Independence didn't really mean all people are really equal. It meant that everyone has rights within the roles that we are fit for, within the natural order of things. Some, he said, have more freedom and should not be taxed because they know how to run things. Some should have different set of rights because they are really only fit to work for people who know how to run things and they should be more heavily taxed and we certainly don't owe them any support. We, of course, meaning the more powerful and successful. Well, that is part of the lost cause ideology implied, uh, embodied today. The noble and good jobs creator without whom those jobs could not survive on their own. Education really only needed for a few job skills for the rest. Women needing protection so that they, meaning the wives and daughters of the upper classes, can have the luxury of an easy life, unworried by having to run things or work. And again, that's not the wives and daughters of those working for those powerful men, because many of them are also working. Racial stereotypes are included of who belongs in which roles of life. Whites are the ones we have to comfort and please. The experiences of people who are not white are less important or even invisible. As I worked on this talk, I also came to realize something. I had intended to talk about the lost cause coming forward from the later half of the 19th century. And especially with the ideas of white people, especially wealthy white men, um, are somehow the real victims if they are not allowed to be dominant. All the lost cause ideology and Dunning School ideas though, actually go back long before the Civil War. That assertion about the Declaration of Independence, meaning people had rights only within their proper places in the world, that is indeed what the practical meaning of that document was when it was created. Jefferson and Washington and Madison enslaved people, even while writing about and fighting for the supposed equality of all. The Civil War, and the years after, with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, were not just part of a long progression of expanded rights. It was an explosion of liberation for millions who had been enslaved. Those amendments enshrined ideas about human rights that contrary to the Muzzian view of history, were not actually practically part of the founders' intention. From the beginning, human rights and freedom were seen as for the wealthy and powerful. Not for black people, not for Native Americans, not for women, not for working class men who didn't own property. Yes, we have had a story in America of those all expanding, but a better depiction of the 19th century was that there was this explosion of black power and liberation in the post-war period, and then a violent and brutal suppression of that liberation and power, accompanied by a romantic story to justify the suppression. We could also talk about the history of both policing and the Second Amendment. In first, the uh, slave patrols meant to catch runaways and terrorize others into not running away. And yes, the transcripts of the Virginia debates about the Bill of Rights show that many, like the hero Patrick Henry, fought for the Second Amendment because 
They feared that a future president unfriendly to slave owning would take away the ability in the South to conscript all white men, including poor white men, into militias to be part of slave patrols. And how both the Lost Cause and Dunning School excused the rise of militias after the Civil War to supposedly restore order and end chaos. The chaos, of course, being who was in power and the order being the proper order of who should have power and who did not. Heather Cox Richardson writes of some of, uh, of, some of this in her book, um, again, I recommend this, How the South Won the Civil War. The ideology that some are more deserving of freedom and rights than others, that those people are also more deserving of economic and political power, they are built into American history from the beginning until now. The flashpoint moments today of resistance, tearing down the statues of white supremacy heroes, fighting for a different kind of public safety than police forces have been designed to do, even changing negative images and logos, all of those are attempts to undercut the ideology that is part of the lost cause and its cousins. Black Lives Matter as a slogan and fact is a threat to that ideology. And it's not surprising that in the last weeks we have seen paramilitary militia called out to prevent black and indigenous and other people of color, as well as white accomplices and allies from challenging the white supremacy ideology. Younger Americans have been taught a somewhat different and more nuanced evidence-based view of American history and especially of Reconstruction. But still a lot of the old ideologies come through because their teachers grew up when these ideologies were considered fact and it's hard to ignore and not pass that on. We are making some progress. Uh, and at the same time, many anti-public school attacks are part our ways to resist that progress. And there are steps backwards for many of the steps forward. Ideologies rooted in white supremacy often continue to influence how we act, how we make policy, and how we elect politicians in America. Well, I believe that it's important as ethical people to interrogate our own unconscious assumptions that parts of this ideology are fact. Read evidence-based history books that challenge what we were taught and that many are still being taught. Read, it, read those books in group settings where you can challenge each other. So back to J John Lewis, if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. If we have our eyes shut, we may in our actions be implicitly re reinforcing injustice. So we do need to wake up, open our eyes and see. If we are true to the principles of human worth and human connection, we have a responsibility to open our eyes, to acknowledge where we have been asleep in the past. When our eyes are open, then we can follow John Lewis's advice. If you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. So thank you. Here we go. Thank you, Joan, for that wonderful presentation and, uh, and inspiration. And now, I think we go back to... Are we, we uh, doing Q&A? Q &A? Do we have time? We ran a little bit long. Um, do you see any questions that are uh, raised there, Ed? Um, no. If anyone has a, a question, they can use the raise hand function, um, where you hit at the bottom of your screen, hit minutes. participants, and then raise hand, or you can type it in the chat, which is back open. I see Bert Friedman raise his hand. Uh, Bert, you can unmute yourself. First of all, I want to say it was just a wonderful lecture. And I appreciate particularly your uh, focus on the Dunning School because 
it, it, it uh, the Dunning, who was a professor at, at Columbia University, I believe, was so influential in creating the myth that you've been focusing on. And he, he was, and of course, uh, your talk was also so in, involved historiography, not only history, but the history of history. And what I'm going to ask you for is first, you have a script. I would love to get a copy of it because I'd love to share it with some of my family and friends. And I would like to use it as a reading list. So, uh, and, and one thing I would add is that uh, added to Dubois, you should also consider the work of Eric Foner, which is in line with that new trend in, uh, in, in history. Thank you so much for your, your talk. You're muted, uh, Joan. I'll put a couple of things in chat. Um, one is my email address. You'll have to remind me to send you something. Um, and two places that there's some good information um, to start. Um, and Moncure Conway is also um, a good resource um, who has that connection to our movement. So I think he's especially interesting. Um, okay, I think, um, let's, let's see, wait a second. We have um, Deborah Goldstein has a question. Deborah, you want to? Um, yeah, I'm something? sorry, I'm actually doing this for Sandra Stein, who did not know how to raise her hand online. So she has a question. Okay, Sandra, we can got to look for you. Ed, do you see? Sandra, can you just speak up? Trying to find her. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, um, okay. Uh, thank you so much for your very informative, moving speech. I'd like to ask what you think of Jefferson and Washington. Are they here? We've always looked at most people as heroes. Uh, how do you feel about them? Yeah, um, you know, I grew up, my father thought Jefferson was probably his greatest hero. Um, so I grew up knowing a lot of the positives. Um, I actually recommend if you can read um, the chapter on Jefferson from Ibram Kendi, he has a very nuanced approach where he talks about where um, Jefferson was an anti-racist, where he was a, a assimilationist racist, where he was a separationist racist, and uh, I think it's important for us in this period to really think about the nuances of people and that we not shove people into either the hero or villain category and that we look at what are they doing and that that is what racism is about, not who, who they are as a character. Okay, I, we have time for maybe one more. I see Irene. Irene, unmute yourself and... Um, Ask your question, Irene. Hi, Joan. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Hi, Irene. Um, hi, hi. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to um, the article you read from the conservative um, commentator and the prosperity gospel that the evangelicals are, are pushing that, you know, we're endowed <laughs> yeah. with certain, um, uh, God has said, said certain people don't deserve to have um, uh, prosperity and others do. And the people who do have prosperity don't really have to share it because it's these pe other people's fate that they're in the, this situation that they're in. Well, and the mythology too, that if you are prosperous, it was your hard work and your superior beingness somehow that made you there, that put you right. there. Um, I, I mean, I think you said it, Irene. <laughs> I, right. I don't need to add much. Um, yeah, I think much of that ideology is part and parcel of that ideology from the beginning of this country that was a piece of who we were. Uh, 
of that there's a few people who can be prosperous and the rest of the people can be um, foundational to help them make that happen. And um, that that's the only reason other people are um, important. Right. Okay. Okay. I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, thank you, everybody, for those questions. And Joan is not going anywhere. She's been part of this movement for 30 years. So she's going to still be available if we have questions. So we need um, we need uh, expansion on this.